I'm going to start my last lecture about Koch now. The, the subject of this lecture continues on from the previous one, which is how do we prove properties of programs using Koch, but where the program is not written in the normal functional programming language of Koch. And I'm going to stick with roughly the same imperative language from last time, where we have variables and, and control structures and also a mutable memory that we can read from and write to. And to motivate the extensions to the HoreLogic framework that I presented last time, I'll start with an example. Here it is. Uh, let's imagine that we have some memory address p. So p is basically, here it's, it's a logical variable standing for some address in memory. And I'm going to run this code that reads from that address, adds one to the, what it reads, and then writes back in. So we're, we're going to increment the value stored at the memory address p. And we can express a specification for this very short program by saying, or re recall from last time, uh, here's a, a precondition, here's a postcondition. Each of these is an invariant, which is a function over a local variable assignment sigma, which I'm not actually going to use here, and a memory m. And the precondition says, if you look up address p in the memory beforehand, you get value 0. And what we want to prove is that afterwards, oh, I accidentally wrote the wrong thing in the, the post condition. I'll fix that. If you look up address p after you've run this command, then now at that memory address we find the value 1. So do, are we convinced that this program meets its specification? I'm convinced too. This is not yet a trick question, but we'll, 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 we'll get there soon enough. Uh, so imagine that I changed this around a bit. Let's say we also have some address q. And I write, before we ran this, this command, we knew that, let's say, Location Q stored the value 2. And I'd like to know that afterwards, because we're, we're not doing anything with Q, it still stored the value 2 to, yeah, OK, I'll start with this version. Do we think that this is still a correct specification for the program? Uh, I don't know, do we? The, 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 the comment is about whether we know that P and Q are two distinct addresses. Uh, to avoid even further levels of complexity, let's assume that, just like in the actual model here, we're reading atomic memory addresses. It's not like in, say, x86, where you can read two word-sized values. And if you have funny pointers, they actually overlap with each other. So two different pointers are really sort of sharing their data. That's not happening here. But we do have to worry about the case where p and q are actually the same address. So if that's true, does this program meet its specification? I hear some no's and yes's. Uh, if, what is true? If, the, if p equals q. Right, so this is a trick question. Because the, the precondition is contradictory in that case. We have that the same memory address stores both 0 and 2. And that is problematic. So let me change this a little bit to get away from that pathological behavior here. Let's say that we started out with 0 in both of these addresses. And then afterwards, we'd like to show that q has retained its value of 0. So now what's the verdict? Does this program meet its specification? It doesn't, because if p equals q, then this could be a perfectly true precondition. But the effect will be not only to change mp to 1, but we'll also change m of q to 1. And we won't be able to meet this post condition. So this kind of reasoning about all the possible cases for aliasing across pointers blows up quickly when you go to verify a large program. And that's why it's useful to have principled ways of writing specifications and doing reasoning about programs so that we don't have to think through this kind of case reasoning for every line of code and every part of every precondition when we're doing a, a verification in Hoare logic. Uh, actually, let me write up now, before I explain how separation logic works, separation logic is the, 
the horologic extension that I'll be suggesting that we use for this kind of thing. And I'll just write up how this specification changes when we use separation logic. It's going to look pretty trivially uh, different at first. It all hangs on the definitions of the connectives that I'll use. Let's say I'll write p points to 0, asterisk q points to 1, or sorry, 0, to match what was up there. And then given the same command, We update the p part of this, the predicate to say there's a 1 there now, and the q part can stay the same. Uh, besides being a little bit shorter to write, but not too much, this is going to turn out to be a correct specification for this program in separation logic. And the key thing is that this star operator, it's a, it's a binary connective, sort of like and in the first example, enforces non-aliasing. It enforces that, that the parts of memory described on the two sides aren't allowed to overlap at all. And that is a very useful primitive to apply throughout our specifications to get all these aliasing assumptions to sort of pop up for free without the extra effort of, say, having a, an extra part of the precondition that says p is not equal to q. And then if we had 10 variables, we'd have 10 choose 2 of these not equal to assumptions. And it wouldn't be any fun at all. Yeah. The memory has become implicit. And I'll explain that formally in a little bit. Or maybe now. So OK, so I'm, I'm going to define a few types that we'll, we'll use to explain what exactly does a predicate like that mean. And the first step, I'll just define these basic domains that we had before in the imperative language for the simple Hoare logic. I'm going to say that by definition, this domain M is domain of total functions from natural numbers to natural numbers. So it's total memories. And let's see, does a substantial fraction of the audience have trouble seeing this far over, or is that in sight for everybody? It's good? OK. I'm just trying to write a funky font like you get with uh, MathBB in LaTeX. <laughs> I should probably write that closer. <laughs> I'll try to do better than this one. Something like that. So we have the type of total memories. Now I'm just going to write something slightly different. I'm writing the kind of harpoon arrow that is missing the bottom arrowhead, which this now stands for partial functions. And to distinguish, I'll call these partial functions heaps. So a heap is a mapping of values for a subset of the possible addresses. And the addresses are natural numbers. So we think of a, a, a heap as only using some of the addresses. And uh, intuitively, the way this connective is going to work is we'll start out with one heap, and we'll break it into two pieces and send one to this predicate and the other to this predicate. And by construction, when we break a heap into pieces, they'll always have disjoint address sets. All right, and I'll also define this type that we were implicitly using last time. A map from strings to natural numbers, which is the type of variable environments. We won't make any changes to that one. And finally, with these, we can define our main type of invariance. So an invariant is just a function from a variable mapping and a, a partial heap, not a total memory anymore, to propositions. So an invariant is kind of a binary relation connecting the values of the variables and the values of the memory addresses that are in some sense assigned to you, whoever is interpreting this invariant. And it, it, is even allowed to decide which addresses need to be present and which ones shouldn't be present. So with these, we can define some interesting invariants. One of the simplest ones is 
empty, which just says, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a shorthand here and ignore the variable environment part of this just to make it easier to write down. But the, the version in the call code retains that. Let's just say this is a predicate over a heap. And it just says the heap is a partial function. It just asserts that the partial function has an empty domain. So this predicate is only true in heaps that actually have no addresses in them. We can also define what it means to have some pointer present in your heap. This is the notation I used over there. We read this, this arrow as points to, where p is a pointer and v is the value that p is pointing to in memory. And here we can say the meaning of this is the domain of the heap is exactly the pointer p. And if we look up p in the heap, we get the value v that was claimed there. So this describes he a heap that has just one memory address in it. And it has exactly the value we expected stored at that address. All right, and so now let me try to define that star connective from over there in that example. One supporting definition is going to be this one that captures when two heaps are disjoint in the sense that their domain sets have no overlap. Their intersection is empty. So we use this symbol for orthogonality to indicate that two heaps are disjoint from each other. And now we can formally define that star operator. And I'll start with the formal version, and then I'll draw a picture that hopefully gives somewhat more of an intuition for it. If we have two predicates of this kind, p and q, and we combine them with the star operator, that describes the set of heaps such that there exists two other heaps, heap 1 and heap, and heap 2, and these two other heaps are disjoint from each other. And the original heap equals the, the union of these two heaps. And here I'm just sort of using our informal notion of, of unions when we represent partial functions as sets. Since they have no overlap in their domains, there's no ambiguity for some case where we're combining two heaps that disagree on the value for some input address because they can't have any addresses in common. And then finally, the, the key thing here is that we say the predicate p needs to accept the first heap, and the predicate q needs to accept the second heap. So what this says is we're describing the set of heaps h that can be split into two disjoint parts h1 and h2, such that each of the two sides is compatible with one of the two predicates that we gave as the arguments to the star connective. So let me draw a picture that might help explain the intuition behind this. All right, so here's a heap. It has all these little memory addresses in it in various positions. And we're asking the question, does this heap satisfy the predicate p star q? And when exactly is that true? It's true when we can partition the heap into two subheaps. And every one of these memory addresses is going to go into exactly one of the two partitions. So let's say this one goes here, and this one goes here. And I'll put this one on this side. And this one I'll put on this side. And let's say this one goes here. And we have to find a way to do this partitioning such that p accepts this side and q accepts this side. And notice that the way we've done this partitioning, by construction, it's the case that there's no aliasing between the pointers that p is controlling and the pointers that q is controlling. So we don't need to do this enumeration of all the inequalities between the pointers that we're depending on. It's implicit just in the fact that we've used this star connective to write down a specification. Any questions about that? What about pointers two pointers? Pointers two pointers are fine. We don't have to specially track which pointers are being pointed to. 
we'll probably also mention in a separate fact that the pointer we're pointing to has some other property. And so for instance, if I write p points to q and q points to r, this is completely fine, assuming that p and q are distinct. If we have a pointer that's pointing back to itself, then they would not satisfy this formula. As long as p and q are distinct, this is completely fine. And we're dividing a heap with two cells into two one-cell heaps, and each of those one-cell heaps gets passed off to one of the two sides of this connective. It's sort of related to what you've seen with linear logic, but with a different presentation that isn't based on a new kind of proof theory. It's defined directly in terms of definitions like that one over there right, with partial functions. That is a commonly used connective with separation logic, but I'm going to avoid it here because it tends to be harder to do proof automation when you're using that kind of construct. But for me, I, I think of pure as referring to a different kind of predicate. And there are some that I would like to introduce that you might call pure predicates. So in particular, if we have, let's say, If we have some cock proposition phi, then we can lift that into a separation logic proposition. And by definition, I'm going to say what that means is the heap is empty and, oh, these look much too similar. That's a bad choice of a variable name here. Let's see, what, what should I call this instead? I'll make it a psi instead of a one of those. Yep. and. The heap is empty and the prop holds. So this is a way we can lift a regular cock proposition into this world of heap predicates by saying, I don't actually care about the heap. Don't give me a heap. I just want to tell you something that's true in the, the base mathematical theory. And one last connective that we'll need is just li lifting the notion of an egg. This can have any type as its domain. I'll omit the types here for simplicity and say, the meaning of this is just that there exists an x such that p applied to x applied to the heap holds. So it's just a kind of rearrangement of the operators to get the natural idea of an existential quantifier for this domain of predicates over partial heaps instead of just the domain of propositions. OK. <laughs> any, any questions about this? I'm, I'm going to start talking next about how we connect this to the semantics of particular programs. But is it clear what the predicates mean? All right, let's see how we connect this with the semantics of programs. I'll just review quickly the the embedded syntax we had of an imperative language from last time. I've made one small change to it. it uh, from the previous version, in the, the data type of expressions, there was an option for reading from memory. And I've taken that out and made reading from memory a separate command. So you have to explicitly say some variable equals what you read from this memory address. And it, it's just easier to stage the, the proof rules doing that this way, because reading from memory is a relatively interesting thing in, in this setting that, that needs some detailed handling in the proof rules. So we'll force every memory read to be a separate step in the execution. But we have expressions that are constants and variables and arithmetic binary operators. And our commands include assignments and memory reads and writes, which are the interesting parts, and then the sequencing if and while from before. And it's basically the same kind of operational semantics that I showed last time. So here's the, the big step semantics for execution of expressions. And we see things like if you're trying to run an if whose test expression is b, evaluate b in the current state s1. And if it's false, then proceed with executing the second command within the if c2. And the result of that becomes the result of the whole thing. 
So it's a pretty conventional semantics. And we're going to use this to justify the soundness of the, the proof principles that we develop for programs in this language. So in particular, what those principles are going to be, mm, I guess I'll leave that stuff over there up and explain more over here. So I'll use this notation, or maybe actually, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to stick to pictures for explaining the meaning of the, the Hoare triple. And you can see the code afterward for what it all means formally. But the basic idea is we're, we're going to write Hoare triples like before, where we have a precondition and a command and a postcondition. Now the precondition and the postcondition are predicates in the same sense. And they are implicitly talking about a memory. And the meaning of this Hoare triple is a little more complicated than before. I'll draw a picture which is pretty similar to the one we saw before. Let's say we started out in memory one, and then we ran the command. And this took us to memory two. So the meaning of the Hoare triple is as follows. I'm going to split the memory into two of these different partial heaps. Here's heap one, and here's heap two. So heap one and heap two have disjoint domains. They cover different memory addresses, but together they cover all the addresses from the original memory. And I want to say that the precondition P applies to heap one. It doesn't even know anything about heap two. And the intuition is heap two is the part of memory that this command C isn't going to read from or write to. So it's, the, it's irrelevant to the execution of C. And we, we sort of call heap one the, the footprint of this program. It's the part of the memory that actually matters for the execution of this program. And one of the big ideas in separation logic is to allow you to reason just about the so-called small footprint of a program and then automatically lift those results to larger memories that include other addresses that your program doesn't actually care about. So of course, it remains true when we add those addresses into the picture, and it's going to leave those addresses unchanged. So then the key way of interpreting this Hoare triple is that we can, again, split the memory into two parts. And we're, now we're looking at the memory after we run the command. And we have the same heap 2 as before. So the, the idea is that h2 is the part of memory that this program is not going to touch. It's not going to read from it. It's not going to write to it. So of course, that part of memory is preserved intact by the execution of, the, of this command. It finishes in exactly the same state as it, it started out in. But we have some new h prime 1 connected to it that satisfies the predicate Q. And in some sense, we can imagine that if we ran H, if we ran the command C directly in H1, where H2 wasn't even there, then we'd get to the same place. We'd transform H1 into H1 prime. Because we don't need H2. It's all irrelevant addresses that this command C is not going to change. So that is the basic pictorial version of what this, this Hoare triple means. Uh, next, I'm going to write up some particular rules for concluding Hoare triples of this kind. Any questions about the basic meaning of it first? It's not allowed to read or write from any of those addresses. They're completely irrelevant to the execution of C. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Is the fact that H2 isn't modified uh, part of that Hoare triple? It is. Yeah. We, we require that. So, so it's uh, the way this is written is sort of, you can think of it as for all H1, H2, there exists 
H1 prime such that this, so for any way of splitting the original heap into two, such that the H1 part satisfies P, if we run C, then there's a way of splitting the result of that such that Q applies to H1 prime. And then, so, so we get to assume this split exists, and then we need to prove this split exists for any way the command could have run. All right. So one of the nice things about separation logic as a, an extension of Hoare logic is that most of the rules that we saw last time keep working without any interesting modifications. So I won't even write those up here. I'll start with the rule for writing to a memory address, which is our first example of, of how this notation gives us some very succinct ways of, of reasoning. So here's a rule for writing to a memory address. I'll write the post condition afterward. So let's see if we can figure out what the right post condition for this rule is. Where we're reading from. Sorry, that's not the one I meant to write. Let's start with the right case. That'll be more interesting. I'm going to write into the address given by E1 the value of E2. And so let's make this say E1. OK, so the precondition says the memory consists exactly of this one address that we care about. It's whatever is the result of evaluating E1 in the current state. And when we look at that address, we see some value v. It doesn't matter what value we see there, because we're going to overwrite it right now. And it's part of the small footprint style of separation logic that the precondition and also the postcondition only talk about the addresses that are relevant for this operation. You don't have to worry about the others. By the way, that's all defined. We can, we can in a general way, add in other addresses that are unaffected after we apply this core rule. So any guesses on a good way to fill in the post condition of this rule? If, that's, if what I've written first is true before we run this write operation, what's going to be true afterward? I can write in a generic part of it. To begin with, we're going to quantify over the local variable environment. What can we say about the memory after this command is run? It's changed. It's changed in what way? Right. Did I see a hand over there? Yeah. Yeah. So. We still have a predicate telling us what is E1 pointing to, but now it's something different, and it's exactly the value of this other expression that we're using here. So this is a, a nice, succinct way of saying exactly what does a write operation do. It just We had some memory with this one slot with whatever in it, and after we'd run the write operation, now we know what's in that slot. It's exactly what we asked to write there. All right, so the, the rule for reading is a little more complicated because it does a variable assignment. I'll, I'll just write it here for completeness. And I'll make this uh, an inference rule. So if we're going to read an address, what we're going to need to know is that the value of the pointer expression is some v. And then we'll, let's read from the pointer into a variable x. And it's a little more complicated to explain what is the post condition here. It's, it's similar in some sense to the original one, but we're going to combine an element of what I wrote for the variable assignment rule last time for more basic Hoare logic. 
So we're going to consider here that this sigma that's passed to the post condition is the current variable assignment. We'll say there exists a sigma prime, which we think of as the variable assignment before we ran this assignment, before we overwrote x with a new value. So we, we have x's old value inside sigma prime. And then we're going to say, I'm going to use this, this pure lifting operator here that takes a regular proposition and turns it into a sort of trivial predicate over memories that doesn't actually claim any addresses that says the new variable assignment is the old one where we've overridden the value of, of x with the value v that we would expect to read out of the memory. And then by the way, the same pointer is still there. I think I might be running too far over there, so I'll put this on a separate line. By the way, the same pointer we started with is still there in memory, and it still has the same value as before. So when we think about these rules, we can relate it to this picture here. For each of these rules, we would be, we're, we're splitting the current memory into two parts. And the part we care about is exactly the one element memory that contains the pointer we're focusing on. And that rule explains how we, tr we transform the heap from the one element memory we started with to the one element memory afterwards when we've done the read or the write. And implicitly, all the other addresses in the memory that go into this H2 part are unchanged by the operation. So we don't need to write anything about them. That comes for free just by the, the definition of separation logic. And we can internalize in the, the set of inference rules the power of that definition by adding one last key rule separate it off here. This one's called the frame rule. I believe it's named after a concept from artificial intelligence about this word frame that has something to do with the context in which some reasoning is happening. But, but what it does for us here is imagine we've proved some Hoare triple PCQ. We're going to automatically, in a black box way, be able to deduce a new Hoare triple that works in a larger memory than the original one worked in. And the new predicate is the original one, but it has this extra conjunct R added into both the precondition and the postcondition. So if we knew that this program had the following effect on some memory, the frame rule lets us say it has the same effect on any larger memory, where it's also leaving alone all the addresses that it wasn't touching before. This predicate, capital R, is basically capturing the idea of some additional memory addresses that this program doesn't care about. And it will work when they're there at the beginning. And when the program finishes, they'll be left in the same state that they started in. And it turns out that as this is formulated, we need one important side condition here. And I'm going to be a little informal about this one. But the formal version is in the Cock code that I'll switch to shortly. We have to compute the set of program variables that capital R mentions. And this is basically, so sigma here is a mapping from variables to values. We have to have some sort of concept of which of those values does R actually look up and depend on. If we take that set and we intersect it, with the set of variables that the command C can modify, then these have an empty intersection. So for any variable that C actually changes, we're not allowed to mention that variable in the predicate R. Otherwise, this would be an unsound rule. Can anyone think of an example of how we would get a crazy, incorrect uh, conclusion if we didn't have that side condition here? Yeah. So if R is set to 0, and then All right, so let's see an example here. If we're assigning x to 1, and I'm going to keep this really simple and say the precondition is empty. I'll, I'll write this in the same notation from over there, actually.
precondition is empty, postcondition is empty. This command works fine, even in an empty heap with no addresses. But if we applied the frame rule naively, we could add in the fact that sigma of x equals, say, uh, 0 or something. We'll add that to both the original state and the final state. And now it's not true, because it could, could be that x started out as 0, but this assignment switched it to 1. And now we have drawn an incorrect conclusion. So the frame rule plus the star connective, I, I'd say these are the two big ingredients of separation logic that make it so powerful and are pretty simple to define, but have many very practical consequences for doing proofs of programs. So any questions about those? Yeah? Uh, is there a reason that the variables are also mutable instead of just using pointers for immutable variables? You can do that. You could use pointers for mutable variables. but somehow more heavyweight. And it might actually be a, a good way to do basic examples here. Sorry? Side condition wouldn't exist. That's true. You'd have to sometimes, you'd have to be writing longer specifications. Your invariance would be longer. And when you start thinking about local variables with function calls, then it, you have to start somehow explicitly modeling a call stack. and it's. Not entirely pleasant. <laughs> yeah? So for the, the whole logic rule there, whenever you produce one of those h1 primes, it's, it's going to be true that h1 prime is the same domain as h1, is that right? For the, whole, the separation logic I'm presenting here, that's true. There are other reasonable presentations where, for instance, you have a primitive for a memory allocation operation or memory deallocation that might grow or shrink by pulling from or putting back inside some external pool of available addresses. But you can also internalize that memory allocator as a library that you're verifying. And then it really is true that the domain is always the same between h1 and h1 prime in this picture. But it's definitely not true that h1 ever gets a hold of any address inside h2. Those are completely firewalled by the, the definition of all this. Yeah. Yeah, so we could also write a variable that might be too small to read. Let me expand this over to the left. It's just as valid to use this rule that just says there exists a v such that e1 is pointing to it. I don't know if that addresses your question. We don't need to know which v it is. We need to, the only reason I'm writing that is so we know that E1 is a pointer that is in the current heap. Somehow, responsibility for E1 has been assigned to us, so we're allowed to write to it. Any other questions? All right, I think that is enough of the basic rules. You, the, all the rules we saw last time, like I said, for basic core logic more or less cont continue to work without any other changes. So I won't go over those again. And I'll show you some automation here that will automatically apply those rules in the same way as the automation we saw last time to verify some pointer programs. So uh, this is a formal definition of that picture of the separation logic or triple, I won't go through it in detail, but you can at least see h1 is quantified universally, h1 prime is quantified existentially, and that's kind of the, the essence of how this encoding works. And here's an example of a nice long proof of a, a lemma that I won't explain at all, which plugs into Cox proof automation to let us use implications in separation logic as rewriting rules, which is a 
very handy thing to be able to do. But I won't dwell on that. This is the stuff corresponding to the syntax notations we saw last time to let us write C-looking programs inside of Calk. It's all defined again here. And now we come to the Horologic rules, and you can see here's precisely the same skip rule we had last time. Skip is a command that's always safe to run. It does nothing. It works for any precondition, and then its postcondition can be exactly the same as the precondition because it didn't do anything. So this same rule continues to be true in the separation logic setting. And actually, I could write empty and empty before and after as the, the hard-coded value of p, and we'd be able to derive all the other versions using the frame rule because skip doesn't modify any variables, so it's sound to star in any other predicate before and after any derivation about skip using the frame rule from over there. OK. I can do it the fancy way. So hprop is defined as the type of predicates over partial heaps. And an invariant is a function from a variable assignment to a, an hprop. And I'll print hprop also. hprop is a function from heaps to propositions. And this is the type of partial heaps, the one with the partial function arrow, not the total function arrow. All right, so then there's some other lemmas on the way to proving the assignment rule, which, take my word for it, is basically the same as last time. We start with, with no assumptions about the memory. And afterwards, we know that, that the current variable assignment was computed from an original variable assignment by overwriting the value of x with the result of evaluating a particular expression e, which is the one that we're assigning to x here. And there's also a separate rule for a, for incrementing a variable, which turns out to be convenient in some cases. A bunch of lemmas here that are just leading up to being able to state the read rule, which is basically exactly the one that's written up there. If, the, if we evaluate expression e, that's a pointer that's pointing to some value v. Here I have written it so v is allowed to depend on the local variable environment, so it might be some, some expression written in terms of the values of other variables. After we read, then the same pointer is still pointing to the same thing, and the new variable assignment s is computed from the original one by this assignment. Then another intermediate lemma, another one of those, and then we get this write rule, which is, much, which is easier to read than the read rule. It says e1 points to v before we write, and afterwards e1 points to e2, essentially, where I'm speaking it, eliding the details of variable contexts and evaluating expressions. And we have the exact same sequencing rule as before. If, if command C1 gets us from P to Q and C2 gets us from Q to R, then if we sequence C1 and C2 together, that will get us from P to R. And we have roughly the same if rule as before. I'm just using different notation. Instead of writing and to modify the preconditions in the two cases of the if, I use star with a, a lifted pure formula inside brackets. So we want, want to check if this if satisfies this specification. We check both the then and the else cases against the same spec, except in the then case, we know that the test expression must have evaluated to true if we went to the then case. So we extend the precondition with the fact that the test expression evaluated to true in the current variable settings. And we say it evaluated to false in the, when we consider the else case. We can also prove a rule about what happens when we have an or in the precondition. We can prove that by proving two separate Hoare triples where we've taken each of the two sides of the OR and made them the two separate preconditions in these two cases. And like before, I have a bunch of other lemmas leading up to the main while rule. Let me skip down to that one. We, can sit, we have to pick a loop invariant like before, and we have to show the precondition implies the loop invariant. And the loop invariant combined with the truth of the loop guard expression will take us back to the loop invariant when we run the body command of the loop. And then afterwards, we know the invariant holds, and the test expression b actually evaluates to false. And then there's a formal definition of that modifies concept from the frame rule that tells us when a command c modifies a particular variable x. And it's just a recursive definition that uses some ors and equalities and false facts to express that and a proof that modifies is sound with respect to the operational semantics, and then finally the frame rule. So we have PCQ. We can conclude RS times PS 
is a new precondition and the new post condition is, is R times Q. Uh, we just need to know this next line is kind of a, a verbose way of, of saying what I wrote there more informally that the set of variables mentioned by R is disjoint from the set modified by C. And this is a kind of extensional way to say that in terms of basically saying R returns the same thing for any two variable assignments that agree on all the variables that are not modified. But that's going to be applied automatically by the, the LTAC machinery, so the details aren't too important to understand what comes next. And then a bunch of lemmas about the behavior of the existential quantifier in both the precondition and postcondition positions. And yeah, the rest of this is all kind of administrative stuff that the automation will use. And then a bunch of LTAC definitions here, which are going to figure out which rule to apply at which point and use the appropriate arguments. But I'm purposely skipping over this, though it could be interesting to look at afterward when I post the code. And then we come to some examples. So before I start working on these examples, any questions about the setup through this point? All right, so let's look at a kind of hello world example. We, we, saw, we saw this last time when we implemented swap that was just swapping the values stored in two local variables. Now we will instead have two local variables that are pointers pointing to two disjoint memory locations and we'll swap the values stored in those two locations. That's what this code says. Uh, recall that I'm, I'm writing brackets around expressions to indicate memory dereferences. So these first two lines are memory reads. We're reading the values from the memory addresses x and y into local variables temp x and temp y, and then writing them back in the reverse order so that we write temp y into x and we write temp x into y. And the precondition tells us that at the beginning, x is a pointer to value a and y is a pointer to value b. And then afterwards, x is a pointer to b and y is a pointer to a. So modulo the notation. It's the usual intuitive idea of swapping values and addresses. So let's prove that. Uh, so the proof goal down here is just a restatement of the lemma, of the, th the theorem statement where the line spacing is a little different. So I'm going to call a tactic called step and it takes an argument that we don't need here, so I'll pass kind of a dummy in there. And this is going to pick which rule of horror logic to use first, and it will use it on our behalf. And so currently we have this sequence of four statements. When I run step, this is split into two sub-goals, one for the first read operation and the other for the remaining steps. And so I can run step and it will handle this read case. And notice that over here is a an existential variable for Q, the post condition that we're going to deduce for this one uh, read operation. And then that becomes the precondition for the next few commands. So when I run step again, we're going to first verify that we can run this read and then come up with a new post condition for here, which will be the precondition for here. So given that what we're doing is reading from X into temp X, uh, any suggestions about what sort of post condition we can expect to have? We're starting out with in a state satisfying this predicate. What predicate will tell us what's up after we run the read command? It's almost the same, but if it was exactly the same, we'd forget about temp x and, and what we now know about its value. Yeah, afterwards we'll say temp x is, well, how can we describe what is the value of temp x in terms of names we already had for things before we ran this assignment? Yeah, after we run this, because temp x is being read from x, the value of x is a. So we should be able to say afterwards, same predicate holds, but now temp x equals a. So that's what I think is going to happen. The syntax might be a little different. Often needs some simplification after that runs. So what this says is y points to b like before, s points to a like before, and S e is the result of a, assigning the value A to temp X in S prime. So it's a little bit of a convoluted way of saying what we came up with, but it's logically equivalent to that. And this form would apply in cases more complicated than what, the one we just used here. So now if we step again, we'll split this 
assign this first read operation that remains off into a separate case, and we'll be able to do roughly the same thing. And so I'll just go up here and make all these, these steps run to completion. And then we get this one obligation left, which is saying, so this first predicate is the one that we computed in this forward direction reasoning starting from the precondition. And it describes how we know the memory looks after this code finishes. And the second predicate on the second line is the post condition that we'd written originally. So we need to prove that the current description of the memory after the program runs implies the one that we required in the post condition. And in this case, it's pretty easy because they're exactly the same formula. And this operator here is uh, implication between invariants. And so I can run a tactic called cancel that applies a much more general procedure than we need here that tries to find matching elements on the two sides of this this implication and cross them off until there's nothing left. And if it succeeds in getting rid of everything on both sides, then these, this must indeed be a valid implication. So that handles that one. And we can make that a one-liner with a small modification so it would work also if there were several of those implications that we, we wound up needing to prove. All right. Uh, quick question. Yeah. I think it would take, instead of thinking it through, I'll just try it. <laughs> I might have, something like that. Uh, yeah, I think this, this implication operator is defined in, in the way you're thinking, but I've marked it as opaque, so we, we can't directly access that fact in the proof because generally we don't want to see the definition expanded. Right. Uh, cancel. All right. Any other questions about this short proof? I'm going to look at linked lists for the next example. So this automation just to emphasize it again, is picking which of the rules from uh, those three and many others are appropriate to use at each point, applying them automatically. And then we know that this proof is justified in terms of first principles from the operational semantics of this programming language, because the, the separation logic core triple is defined in terms of that semantics. And we don't need to trust any of the details of how these rules are written, because it's all related back to the, the underlying type theory through the operational semantics. All right, let's think about linked lists. And I've put up here a recursive definition of linked lists, which is easier to explain with a picture. So let me do that. So what I'm defining here is a predicate that tells us, it takes two arguments. The first one is a pointer p, and the second one is a functional list, ls, of natural numbers. And this captures the idea that p is the root of an imperative linked list whose data elements are exactly the numbers that appear in the, the functional list, ls. And this is written by recursion on the structure of ls. And in each case, we build a, a predicate of the separation logic assertion language. And a picture can illustrate maybe a little better what that pattern matching is saying. So if we have a linked list rooted at P and representing the functional list L, what that means is either we have an empty heap or L is actually a non-empty list, and its first element is x, and the, the rest of it is L prime. And P is a pointer to 
a two element record storing in the first field x and in the second field some new pointer p prime. And furthermore, in a disjoint part of the memory, we have another linked list that starts at p prime and represents the elements from L prime. So for any list, we can recursively evaluate this function and it reduces to existential quantifiers for all of the intermediate pointers in the list and tells us that we're going to run to the end and get to a null pointer, which we actually get by asserting in this case p equals 0 for the, the null pointer. So for instance, if we started with some pointer and we ran it on the list xy, then this winds up being equivalent to a picture sort of like this one saying that we have p points to x with some p prime inside. And then p prime points to another no, uh, list node with a y and uh, a null pointer inside. And because we're separating, in this definition, all, all the different points to facts are separated with stars, we know by construction that this is a, an acyclic linked list. There are no linked list node addresses reused across the different parts of the list. OK, so when I write the star here, from the definition of star from before, we, we get that the, the memories that correspond to the two sides of the star operator have to be non-overlapping. There are no addresses that both of them use. And this, uh, like, if you have an F, uh, point to P? Let's see. There could be some other cell somewhere that is pointing to P, but it couldn't. <coughs> it couldn't uh, that other cell couldn't be p. It can mention p, but, but so, so the disjointness that star gives us is only about the domain of, of the function that is the heap. It's not constraining the range. So can it be cyclic? This, this definition rules out cyclic lists. For, for one thing, we always get to a null pointer in the end. And so I guess that alone would imply that there are no cycles. But also, we, we get that any of this, the, so we have a sequence of memory cells like this one with, with two locations each. Because we've written star here, we know that all the other cells used within here are different from the cell used here, because they couldn't reuse the address p by the disjointness requirement of the star operator. Yeah. It's the overloaded version that I wrote on the board over there earlier. It's not there anymore, though. But it's, it's the natural lifting of the meaning of exists into this domain. All right, so let's see this in action. I've preemptively queued up two useful rewrite rules that are just about regular old functional lists. I can show you what they prove. This one relates two functions from the standard library One's called rev and the other is called rev append. And the meaning of rev append is that we're going to reverse the first argument and then concatenate it onto the beginning of the second argument. So one equivalent way to reverse a list is to rev append the same list onto the nil list. Because rev append just means reverse and then append. And then rev involutive is another one that is useful for this proof, which says if you reverse twice, you get back to the same list that you started from. So I've added those as rewrite hints. So whenever they, the terms that look like those appear in this proof, they will automatically be, be simplified by replacing them with the other side of the equality from those lemmas. And I'm also going to declare linked list as opaque so that it doesn't, the definition doesn't get unfolded in the course of a proof. All right, so I'm defining a tactic that 
finds all opportunities to rewrite the goal using equalities that appear as assumptions within the proof state. Auto rewrite doesn't use assumptions, it only uses lemmas that have been registered ahead of time. And we'll, we'll expand this tactic in the course of the proof, but this is the, our current notion of problem specific simplification. So I'm going to use this to prove that this function is correct. It's a, an in place imperative reversal function for linked lists. And it takes an argument LS, which is going to be the mathematical list that we, we think of representing at the beginning in the form of an imperative list laid out in memory. But we can ignore the specification component for a moment. We're going to accumulate the result in this variable r, and it will start it out with 0 for the null pointer. And I have a dummy loop invariant here. This is not going to be a strong enough one for this, this proof. Uh, we're going to loop as long as the input pointer p is non-null. And as long as it's not null, I'll read its next pointer into the temporary variable. Then I'll overwrite its next pointer to point to the current list that we're accumulating, r. Then I'll overwrite r with the address of the, the cell that we are processing now, and finally replace that cell address with the temporary value that we read out of there. Let me draw a picture to show what this sequence of modifications is accomplishing. So. So as this language is defined, there's no concept of which variables are in scope. All variables are defined. They all have values. Most of the values won't matter because the a program can only use a finite set of variables. Was that your question? Yeah. So. I'm going to, let's pretend, I'm just going to comment this out for now. The LS part isn't important. Think of, the, this is just a code listing. It's, the, the function was just for specification purposes. Eventually we'll want to mention LS in this loop invariant. And that's the only reason I bound it over there. That will be in the precondition that we write down for this code in a separate stage. So, So the body of the loop is where we're in a case where r points to a list, and we've now learned that p points to some cell, because p is not nil. There might be some other cells afterwards. And so we're taking temp and assigning it to the value of the next pointer from the cell that, that p is pointing to. And then we're taking that pointer, and we are redirecting it to go to r that we'd already accumulated. So we're taking the, the, the cell we're processing and making it the new first cell of the list that we're building up. And then we're going to overwrite r with the original p. So now r is pointing to this, this new longer list we've built by adding one element to the front. And finally, let's overwrite p to point to the next cell of the original list that we were saving in temp. So that's what this code is doing. We're going to step down one list. As we encounter each cell, we push it to the beginning of another list. And this leads to having that second list that we're building up in the reverse order of the original list, and we've reused all of the, lo the memory locations from the original list to do this. We didn't have to do any more allocation. All right. Any questions about this just as a program and not about the ways that we would prove it correct? Does it make sense how this algorithm works? It's kind of the hello world example of separation logic in action. Reverse a linked list in place. All right, so we can just make sure Conk is happy with this definition. It all parses and type checks. And down here, I've written the specification we're going to prove for it. We'll assume at the beginning that the local variable p is the 
the root pointer of a linked list representing a value ls. And then after reverse runs, we want to know that the, this result value in variable r is now representing a linked list that is the reverse of the original. And from the way that this Hoare triple over here is defined, as someone pointed out before, we know that, so we have this, this h1 that represents the part of the heap this program actually touches, and it somehow steps to some h1 prime, which in this formulation needs to contain exactly the same memory addresses as the original heap contained. So this specification tells us that somehow the linked list nodes from the original input here are being reused to represent the reversed list from down here. It doesn't tell us how that's working. We could have some funny reorderings of, of nodes where we go, we skip nodes and take every other node from the input list and then link those all together in, in order and then take all the other nodes that we, we had that we hadn't covered that first time. But probably if we see a spec like this, we expect the implementation that I've shown here. Though we won't need to know that that's exactly what's happening to, to use this theorem. Oops, I need to put back that ls parameter, which was included just so that we'd be able to mention it in the loop invariant eventually. Where does rev come from? Rev is defined in the, the Cox standard library. It's just a classic functional programming list reverse function. All right, so to prove this, we're going to need a loop invariant. Based on the picture I've drawn there, do we have any proposals for a good loop invariant to use in this spot? It's going to need to mention the list ls, which stands for uh, wh which data values are stored in the linked list at the beginning of executing this code. S is the local variable environment that tells us the value of each one of these variables that's being manipulated here. So we'll definitely mention P somewhere. And so we'll mention R somewhere. <coughs> Let me start us out with one part of this. I'm, I think we want to say that there exist two lists, LS1 and LS2. So I said ls is the result of concatenating them together. That's what this plus plus means. And then let's say something about p and something about s. We don't know what yet. Sorry? Do we want to reverse one of them? Uh, we should definitely mention reversal somewhere. Oh, yeah. So, so maybe what I want to say, maybe what you're pointing out is I should write rev append here instead of what I originally wrote, or no, that's sorry, I was right the first time. But somewhere in these dot dot dots, we'll use reversal. <laughs> yeah. So the linked list predicate thing should hold between S of P and L of P. Okay, so P is pointing to the part of the list that we didn't yet manage to traverse over in the process of doing all of this, and th that part remains in the original order. Okay. And how about for the rest of this? Uh, yeah, let's try that. Oops. I, I think I probably wrote this a different way before, so I'm going to switch it to using rev append up there so we can just write ls1 here. So we can split ls into a part that is the reversal of ls1 with ls2 added afterwards, and ls1 is the set of elements that r is pointing to, and ls2 is the, the set of data values that p is pointing to. So I think this one is going to work pretty well. Any questions about the meaning of that invariant? Right. Yeah, it's, uh, let's see. It's not for every list, I think. Right. Uh, did I put that in here? Yeah, I guess. 
there's a little lemma in here that somewhere that tells us what it means. Rev append L L prime equals rev of L appended to L prime. Okay. Doing this proof. I'm going to repeat stepping with, uh, did I define the tactic for that? So there's our, our rewrites here. I'll, I'll move this tactic lower so we can change it without changing the program. I'm going to repeat step with this particular choice of rewrites and we will move through repeatedly applying rules of separation logic to simplify this program. And some sub goals will be left. Maybe it's not going to work like this when I haven't added all the right hints and it's getting stuck in some scary spot, so I will do this one at a time. Okay, we have to handle an assignment to R of the value 0. And then we get another part. I'll just keep running this as long as we're seeing core logic goals. I'm going to save this goal for later and do that using a command called focus that lets us pick a sub-goal number and we're just going to skip to that one for now. So what we need to show, we're, we're basically showing that the state before we enter the loop implies the loop invariant. And what we know is that P, S of P, we have a linked list starting at P. We need to know there's a linked list starting at P as well as a linked list starting at zero. So it's pretty easy to do the first part. If I just run cancel, then I think we, f or maybe not, we figure out that these two match. I guess that part isn't quite set up properly. But the one thing we notice here is we have a linked list rooted at zero. So how can we simplify a formula that says there's a linked list whose head pointer is the null pointer? If, if the head pointer is the null pointer, it's an empty list, and actually it takes up no space. We can, we can just replace it with, with empty. And so one way we can do that is by stating a lemma about null linked list that says if we have a 0 and any list, then what this implies is that the list is actually nil. And we can handle that. We can prove this by case analysis on the list and then canceling. I think this works, or maybe not. All right, I, I marked linked list as an opaque predicate, so I'm going to move this up before we made it opaque so that we can get the right behavior. And then we just need to know nil is equal to nil, which is indeed true. So now we can take this rewrite rule and we can use it down below there. Oh, actually, instead of implies, I'm going to make this an e equivalence and use tactic for proving an equivalence by proving both directions of implication. So now down here, we can rewrite using linked list null. And then this one, where it previously said there's a linked list rooted at 0, and it's, it's representing x, changes to saying x equals nil. So now, let's see, is this going to work? We just need to prove that x equals nil, and it's a, x is a, an existential variable, so we get to choose its value, and we can just decree that it equals nil by reflexivity, and now we've, we've realized that that variable x is nil. And this was the goal I skipped before. It used to have a, that question mark x in it. Now that we know that question mark x is nil, this is a trivial fact. We're appending the reversal of nil to the beginning of ls. That just gets us back to the original ls. So reflexivity can handle that. And then we have this case of doing a read operation. I'll just run this, each of these steps, and we'll see if we get to something too hard. Um, OK, so, so this one is trying to read from address p plus 1. We have a linked list rooted at address p. And also, we, we're going to know that p is not 0. 
So what that means is that by the definition of linked lists, if P is not zero, it must be possible to split the list into two parts where one has an initial list cell and then there's the full rest of the list. And that tells us that if we, we read from address P plus one, we will actually find memory mapped in at that address and we'll be able to read something and it'll be exactly the value that we expect. And to make that work, I'm going to prove one other lemma about linked lists. It'll be kind of the dual to this first one. It's when we know that the head pointer is not null. When p is not equal to 0, then I'm just going to copy sort of what we wrote up here. But the original definition worked by recursion on the, the functional list. This one's sort of working by case analysis on the pointer, whether it's null or not. So I'm just going to say this is equivalent to their exist x and ls prime such that ls equals x with ls prime. And the rest, I think, will stay the same. And I just need to do inversion on h0 to get the rest of it to go through. All right, so, this, so these are sort of the two defining equations for this predicate stated in a different way from how we wrote the original recursive definition. And now we'll be able to use this not null rule down here. And actually, I'm going to change this definition of the predicate to rewrite with the things we've just disco discovered here. Linked list null. We should always try to rewrite with that. And by the way, if you have a a hypothesis saying something is not equal to something, that might be just what we need to apply linked list not null. And I'm going to use this syntax to say we're going to use h to discharge the side condition of that rule. So let's see how this goes. Now rewrites automatically makes that change for us. And we should be able to cancel and reflexivity like before and do that too. We should be able to use rewrites here. Take another step. Oops. So we have S prime of P is not zero. So we should be able to use that to rewrite here. Yeah, it should have. I think I need to write the fancier rewrite. So do I rewrite? Maybe not. Link list not null. It's a linked list where the pointer is not equal to zero. Why doesn't it like that? Hmm. I'm not sure why that one is not working here. So since there isn't much time left anyway, I will just use the tried and true approach of switching to the one that already works. So I think this is the same fact that was just proved, although it's stated a little differently. I don't know if that has an effect on it. So this one is written a little differently, but this is essentially what I just wrote. We, we, we try to rewrite using the null rule, and if we find a not equals hypothesis, we try to use that to rewrite using the non-null rule. Yeah, so I don't know if that somehow explains it. I'll just stick with this for now. Uh, so then we can repeat our rewrites tactic, and oh, here I wasn't even passing it as an argument to step, so that might explain something. And then try to use rewrites and cancel to prove any of these implications and use auto on the rest. And then that finishes off this proof. OK, so that was a little rickety. But the, the theorem is now proved in the end. 
there was there was a bunch of other stuff that I was I was hoping to get to, but I think it's better to wrap things up at this point. Uh, any questions about separation logic or high-level elements of how this, this proof worked, since the low-level elements I'm in, intentionally leaving behind the magic curtain? Yeah? So do you do big software verification projects in this style? Or? Depends what you mean by big. Uh, I don't know. What's the biggest thing that is? R roughly 1,000 lines of code. That's independent of this. That's not a verification project. Oh, it's not. Okay. Yeah, UrWeb is a high-level functional language. It's pretty different from this kind of, of setting. Okay. Yeah. So what is the name of the project that you used for Bedrock? Bedrock? In, in general, Bedrock is a system for verified multi-language programming inside of Coq where everything gets compiled to assembly and that's what the final theorems are about. Yeah. Right. In, in practice, it's not too difficult to figure out how to use the frame rule in, in this kind of setting, at least. More interesting is writing the automation that justifies that choice of the frame rule. Uh, that you, don't have, you need to not just compute the way to use the frame rule, but also a proof that you've made the right choice and do the right commuting and associating of operators and the predicates to line it up. But it works. It, it, it's possible to build predictable automation like that that works in the concurrent setting also and handles a variety of other kinds of complications. That's the short answer. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.